everybody, and welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is your AMC Editor-in-Chief, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the internet, coming to you live from right here at the AMC Movie News Headquarters here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is AMC's Mark Ellis. Two days in a row, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk movies. <laughs> and AMC's Christian Harloff. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So a new poster seen here for the upcoming rebooted Fantastic Four has hit the web. In the film, four young outsiders acquire amazing abilities after a trip to an alternate universe changes their physical forms in unforeseen ways. Fantastic Four hits AMC theaters on August 7th. John, what do you think of this new poster? The poster is fine. It, it's actually a, it, it's a nice shot. It, it's a nice shot. It was probably the iconic shot of the trailer that came out. But what interests me more... You saw it just for a glimpse there. Let's bring that image up here. Is that somebody tweeted this picture to me this morning. You see in the upper corner, that's actually a giant banner of the Fantastic Four, which gives us our first really good, clear look at Thing. And I got to tell you, I love it. I love the non-symmetrical, the nice, evenly laid out little bricks in his face and blah, blah. It looks mutated. It looks messy. <laughs> it looks the way I want him to look. And he looks badass. I think the, the look of him is good. Look, Mr. Fantastic, we won't really get a, an idea about whether we like or don't like what they're doing with him until we see his powers in action. Same with Sue. Johnny Storm, it's going to be a guy with flames. We, we knew that, so no big revelation there. The thing has been the one I've been really curious about, that and Doom, how Doom is going to look ultimately. But I got to tell you, I love this look of Thing. The poster, yeah, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a decent poster, no problem with it. Not exactly making me jump out of my seat either, but I'm loving that picture of Thing. Anyway, Mark? I like the poster better because I like, really? the, I like the air of mystery. Yeah, I ah, like the fact okay, that you get, get to it. see their backs. And you're right, it was the money shot that was in the trailer, and it, it, that, that's where the trailer climaxed with. We see this mysterious blue light. What's doing that? And you get the hint of what their powers are. You get to see the Thing, and you're like, oh, that's the rock, dude. You get to see the, uh, you get to see the hands on fire. So you get to yeah. see them about to go off on some sort of mission. So it gets me excited about the movie not just the fact that it's these four people that are in another movie that i hope is good this time there's actually <laughs> this the time. threat there's a mission that they're about to embark on that's the exciting thing about this poster it's the perfect amount of tease for me uh, I, I love the poster i think the poster for me was the the image that stood out the most in the trailer yeah like you're yeah. saying like that was the one that when people were taking screenshots of it and put it on instagram that was the picture that, that was they the were one, doing yeah. so it makes sense for them to do that um and like mark said you, you get a glimpse of kind of all their powers through that with even the visible visible girls is, is a bit shaded which is kind of cool i agree with you i think that that, that picture to see the, the thing is awesome yeah i, I wanted to it. know because that's the one that's the one that has to deliver that's mm. a, and doom as well, but but thing first and foremost because even though there's Michael Chiklis's version was a very cartoony, it fit the tone of that movie, and that, even those movies weren't great, but fit the tone of whatever it was. Yeah, but that's the thing I remember that that guy, the one that I'm looking with that with that face, and you see because when you have uh, Jamie Bell playing him. The first question is, how's that guy going to play? Well, there you go. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how he's going to play him. And the other, the other characters in that particular picture, I don't love because it almost seems a little Photoshopped, but my eyes go to the thing. So yeah. if I'm pulling away the most thing out of there, I'm in. It's a good right. point, though, is that the thing looks as good as, and I mean, I could have done the the Johnny Blaze one, yeah. you, know, or, you know, or the you know the Human Torch one. Excuse me, I could have done that right. one. I, I, it just the thing is the one that's the movie ready version. Yeah, you that's know, the one of, that has to hit. Yeah, yeah. Now people are going to be writing. Mark Ellis said on Movie Talk that Johnny Blaze is going to be in the new Fantastic Four. You heard it here Four. first. <laughs> the other guy that's on fire. <laughs> All right, what's next? The first trailer for the new Arnold Schwarzenegger film, Maggie, has also hit the web. Maggie stars Schwarzenegger as Wade, a farmer whose teenage daughter, Maggie, played by Academy Award nominee Abigail Breslin, excuse me, has been infected with a deadly zombie virus that is spreading across the globe. Wade is warned about the changes that Maggie will now go through, and that, after eight weeks, he must place his daughter in quarantine with other infected people. However, as the days go by, Wade finds himself struggling more and more with his decision about how best to protect his sick child. Christian, what do you think of this trailer for Maggie? I have to be honest. I think this looks fantastic. <laughs> I haven't protected my daughter since Alyssa Milano in Commando. Um, I think it looks great. I really do. I think it looks like the best acting Arnold has done since coming out of retirement. Uh, he's been, he's looked rusty. He's looked like he's been phoning it in. I like The Last Stand, but 
there weren't so much dramatic chops in areas. The things that he's done so far hasn't been a great comeback. This movie, to me, when I see the premise of him in a zombie film, which I haven't, and it's more of the 28 Days Later type zombie film is what I, more of like a virus than the actual dead. Um, I was intrigued by it because it looked, because I, I bought the fact that Arnold could carry this role and to protect his daughter and the, and the talent that they have in the film. I had never even heard of this film until earlier this morning. Um, will it turn out to be a turd? Maybe. But for the trailer that I saw, I, I'm, I'm into it. Look, there were a lot of people, uh, myself included, when the first news came out about, okay, Schwarzenegger is going to be in a zombie movie. It's like, okay, so another desperate grasp, but just reach for something that's an ongoing trending thing right now, zombie stuff and whatever. And, you know, Schwarzenegger's going to come across as wooden in it. And wait a minute, he's supposed to be Abigail Breslin's dad. Okay, <laughs> can't wait to see the trailer for this. I love yeah, this trailer. Right. No, I, I, I flat out love this. I must have watched it three or four times this morning when this trailer came out. I think this looks fantastic and what's really cool about it is when you walk away from the trailer you realize this is not a trailer this is not a movie about zombies this is about a movie about a father and a daughter and who thought you would talk about a movie that shies away from the glitz and glam and, and high profile stuff of whatever and focuses more on the human story of it who would have ever thought you'd say that about a Schwarzenegger movie but it does and I'm I'm totally sold bought in on this this looks incredible I can't wait I'm really conflicted about this because I, I love the premise, but Arnold Schwarzenegger to me was always the only guy on earth that could do any of those things. He was the only guy on <laughs> earth that could have saved Alyssa Milano in Commando or in Predator or in T2 or in True Lies or any of that stuff. Now, this is a smaller movie where I feel like this dad role could have been played by a lot of different actors. Now, sure. having said that, Arnold Schwarzenegger looks fantastic in this. I had no idea that he could do the single tear role that he did <laughs> in there. I mean, the I think Abigail Breslin's character is going to that's it, it the way you usually see zombies like when you see them on Walking Dead is they get bitten, somebody gets bitten by a zombie and then they're going to turn into a zombie and it's going to happen like that. They're going to wake up then they're this one it's more of a slow burn. It's more of yeah. a yeah. I like that somebody get her to Bill Murray's house quick, you yeah. know? Like I I like that element of it so the movie overall I'm totally sold on. Arnold Schwarzenegger I just I'm wondering why he took this. I'm wondering why why he was cast in it, but it still looks cool to I, me. I could say I think one of those reasons is what Arnold's has always been good with himself throughout his career is reinventing himself. He's always been good at that, like to where he's to make the change from bodybuilder to action star to politician to comedy to comedy. He, he knows what and do they always work? No, but he takes the risk. He makes the moves and he's doing it for a smaller role like this. It reminds me of kind of when Stallone did Copland. Right, um, yeah, yeah, great did example. That, he did that smaller film to where you're going to really test his chops because you're not going to test his acting chops when he's up against Bruce Willis and Stallone in Expendables 2. It's going to be a lot of <laughs> jokes. You're not going to be like, oh, okay, you can't take Arnold seriously, and especially with like Last Stand, even though I enjoyed that movie. Um, this is a movie that you get to see. Oh, wait, like Mark said, he, he's able to do that? Great, and then maybe then you'll get more excited maybe for uh, Terminator. But how's the studio going to sell this movie? That's my big question. Are you gonna? Are they going to panic? And they're going to say, "Well, okay, we got Schwarzenegger, so we got to make it we Schwarzenegger on the poster because that's not what this movie looks like from this trailer." So what's the next? That's not even working. Like? Anymore, yeah, but that's though. not. Yeah, that's the yeah. point. That's not working anymore. Putting Schwarzenegger action on the trailer did not work for Last Stand, and I loved Last Stand. Yeah. But Schwarzenegger action role for that one where he's the DEA agent. Uh, oh yes, uh, uh, sabotage. Sabotage, didn't work, which yeah. I didn't hate, but no. most people did, and, yeah. and it didn't work. So. All right, shift it around a bit. Look, this is not going to be a blockbuster. It's just not. No, the, I think the studio knows and that. And if this marketing campaign stays on the course that it did with this trailer, then I think that's the right tone to set. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? A few months ago, some speculation emerged that Comedy Central's Key and Peele may be developing a feature-length film version of their Substitute Teacher sketch. Now it appears to be official. The original Substitute Teacher sketch stars Keegan-Michael Key as Mr. Garvey, an inner-city substitute teacher who doesn't quite fit in when he's assigned to teach a room full of middle-class white students. According to the reports, Jordan Peele will take on the role of a rival teacher. Mark, buy or sell the idea of a Substitute Teacher movie. Who? Oh, M. Ark. M. Ark, what, what's up? I am totally <laughs> buying this because they're your reference. That sketch <laughs> is so funny. These Key and Peele are, are attached to so many projects right now. There's always these rumors. There was a rumor that they were going to be in a cop movie for a little while. I don't know if that's still happening. But if this is the one that they're opening with, it's 
perfect. That sketch is so funny. These guys are so talented. They have so many sketches on Key and Peele that could be made into movies a la what Saturday Night Live tries to do yes. or you at least used to try to do. So I think this might be the next show where you could have multiple spinoffs because these sketches have, and especially when you're looking at a classroom comedy or classroom drama, it's just right for that. Them playing rival teachers, it's, it's perfect. I'm totally buying this. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's get let's get in here. Let's get in here. I'm for real. <laughs> oh, I'm for real. This, I love this news. I think this is fantastic. Look, Key and Peele to me, look, do I love every sketch that they do? No, but that's what great comedic geniuses do. They, they throw a lot of risks, and some risks don't work out, but when they hit, they hit huge. Like some, there are key, there are probably five or six key, key and Peele sketches that I could just sit down and watch all mm -hmm. day. And this is one of them. I remember laughing myself sick the first time I saw this one. And you can see how, look, with a lot of the Saturday Night Live ones that happened in the 90s, whatever, they felt like sketches just stretched out. I think there's potential you could do this, especially when they're talking about putting in a rival teacher and all this kind of stuff. I'd love to see this character in more diverse situations. I'm in love. Look, this movie might suck and it might kill the idea of turning their sketches into movies, but I'm glad they're taking the risk and trying it because I think the potential is there that it could be hilarious. So for me, it's a big buy. Yeah, I'll buy it for the risks as well, too, but also buy it because when you have Saturday Night Live has had the monopoly on, on sketch comedy yeah. for a very long time. And even though the show's not that good right now, it still is the one you think of when you hear a sketch. But throughout the years, you've had the living colors. You've had, and then and then it's tra uh, transferred over to the DVD and streaming and stuff. To where you have, even even Mister Show has caught on mm. a big life. The Chappelle and Show too. Yeah. The Chappelle Show is, yep. and, and so the, so Key and Peele are the ones now that everyone's talking about as the fresh young uh, sketch show. And everyone, I, I've actually never seen an episode. Um, really? No, but I can't. But I hear about it everywhere. Come on, I Kirk go. Stein. I, I know, <laughs> and I've heard. But that that's the yeah. thing is that I know the sketch because I've heard about it so much. I need to see it and I want to see it. And I like these guys in, in general. So it makes sense for them to make a movie right now and to, especially it's almost like when you adapt something from a very popular book or a very popular comic, it's something that's very popular that the characters, if they know these characters well enough, which they seem like they do, it's a Wayne's world. You know, it's a, it's, it's one of these movies that could become a mega hit through a sketch because these guys get to write it they get to put, have their input so it could be something very special all right sin Eid, what's next <laughs> according to deadline three-time academy award nominee bradley cooper is going to direct and most likely star in an upcoming incarnation of a star is born the project was previously in development with clint eastwood set to direct and beyonce in the leading role but beyonce left the project and it has been sitting on the shelf ever since according to the reports beyonce may be back on board with the film in what would be a star is, a star is born's fourth incarnation on the big screen christian do you buy or sell bradley cooper directing a star is born I buy it because I think I could see Clint Eastwood kind of giving it to him to where he's just yeah. like, hey, kid, I don't want to work with this Beyonce girl. What are you doing? And then Beyonce's <laughs> like, oh, I don't want to work with him either. So now Bradley Cooper gets to do it. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it, it, I, I'm very curious to see Bradley Cooper direct. I want to see what he does. I think that there's there comes a progression in, in when you hit a certain level that you're able to george clooney's done and all these actors if they have joseph, joseph gordon levitt who's a, a i think a, a not lesser actor but as far as um star quality right now lesser than bradley cooper and bradley cooper if it's a passion that he wants to do and if th that's what he wants to do and a star is born is where he wants to go with it great i don't know if beyonce can act i have no idea maybe he and beyonce have had conversations to where she wants to work with him and he she's a performer we know she's one of the best performers out there now can she act and this kind of this role is kind of fitting um <laughs> so i would like to uh, yeah i buy it because i want to see what bradley cooper can do as an actor i mean Mark. as a director uh i i gotta sell it until i <clears throat> until i see it. it's not anything that intrigues me and i think that we're gonna be talking about another movie later on the show where there is an actor wants to be a director and they make comedy out of it this is just another one of those things where i think yeah i, I just need proof that you can do that you can pull that off especially when you're directing and starring in a film that's a lot to take on plus if you're directing somebody who's not used to being in front of the camera in an acting world like what beyonce will be doing in this movie now again we don't know if beyonce is actually going to be cast in this or if she wants to be a part of this but maybe that's why Bradley Cooper's brought on like you said Christian maybe there was some shake up behind the scenes it's like okay well if Bradley Cooper directs it would you be interested in this so I just I don't know enough about him as a director yet to be able to buy this I'm sorry I'm very marginally going to buy this like the the, the pessimist and the skeptic in me wants to go 
Yeah, a guy who gets three Academy Award nominations in a row. Now he thinks he's big stuff, and he thinks he, can, he thinks he can do anything. So yeah, let me direct, let me write, blah blah. But but on the non-pessimist side, look, this guy's been in this business a long time. I've been a big fan of Bradley Cooper since he was on Alias. I always thought he was the guy that Jennifer Garner should have ended up with in Alias. But that, that was just me. I was alone in that. Um, <laughs> and also, look, he just worked with Clint Eastwood, mm-hmm. which he has gone on record said it was his favorite experience ever working with the director. I'm sure you're absolutely right. I'm sure there were some talks between Eastwood and Bradley Cooper about this other project that Eastwood was going to do, Star is Born. And look, for a first-time director, this is a nice project to do something like that with. There's not going to be a lot of expectation coming along with a title like Star is Born. This isn't like the next Star Trek film. This isn't like the new Avengers film. This isn't a $200 million film. This is a good first film for a guy to test his chops on. You know, maybe working with Eastwood has really rubbed off on him, made him really want to try this, and someone's willing to give him the shot. So for those reasons, I'm, I'm going to buy it. What's next? Spring Breakers writer and, uh, writer and director Harmony Corrine is working on developing his newest project, The Trap, and he has just had a cast change. According to reports, Academy Award-winning actor Jamie Foxx has dropped out of the film and has been replaced with Idris Elba. Benicio Del Toro will also star in the film, with Al Pacino, Rob Pattinson, and James Franco also possibly appearing in supporting roles. The Trap is said to follow two very different childhood friends. One is very successful and the other has spent most of his life a convict. When the latter man is released from prison, he becomes determined to seek revenge. John, buy or sell the sounds of the trap with Idris Elba on board. Oh, poor me. I just lost an Academy Award winning actor out of my movie and I have to put one of the hottest, most sought after actors in Hollywood today in the movie instead with Idris <laughs> Elba. Oh no, I might have Al Pacino and all. Like, uh, this sounds great. This sounds to me, this has the feel to me. What was that one Sean Penn film uh, with uh, that was directed by Eastwood? Mystic uh, River. Myst- Mystic River. Thank you very much. This has a Mystic River kind of fe- feel to it a little bit. Or that one with Kevin Bacon where he was the security guard that abused the kids. And, Sleepers. And the kids. Oh, was yeah. that was it? I Sleepers? am on fire. <laughs> Holy yeah. crap. Do I win money for this game? Fact yeah. checker Mark. Um, it has that type of feel to it with a cast like this. I, yeah, I, I, this is exciting to me. For me, it's a big buy, Mark. Yeah, it's a huge buy. Look at the cast. I mean, that, that's... That's all you need to do. Like when you say, when you have somebody like Bradley Cooper, who's a great actor, but now he wants to direct a movie with Beyonce. I don't know enough about that. I know who these dudes are. I know what the premise is. It sounds great. Replacing Jamie Foxx, who everybody knows I love, with Idris Elba. That's that's pretty much a win win either way. Yeah. And I don't. I wonder if Fox dropped out of this to do the Mike Tyson. I think that's what biopic. I mean. Yeah. Which is. I think he wants to do Annie Two. It's a, I think yeah. that's what he's gearing up for. If so. he was Mike Tyson in Annie Two, <laughs> yeah. I would totally see that mashup. But yeah, I'm totally buying the trap. Looks awesome. Oh, huge buy. And I'll tell you what for. Spring Breakers did something like I never saw the internet get so angry and so, like at each other uh, over a movie because that movie to me was very similar to what. Uh, what, excuse me, oh, I can't get the movies out of my head. The one, uh, um, just throw the premise. Come I on, can, I can, I can, <laughs> the horror movie, the one with uh, that we were just talking about recently, it's almost like Home Alone, but a horror film. Yeah, uh, yeah anyway, it's uh, You're Next. You're Next. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what You're Next did in, in, I hated that movie, You're Next, for the beginning. And then when I realized what it was, I was like, oh, wait a minute. And that's how I felt with Spring Breakers. Like the beginning of Spring Breakers, like, what is this movie? And then I'm like, Oh, and that's why when I hear this seems like different from his other projects. This seems like a very cohesive, full story, not not a parody. And when you look at that side by side with Idris Elba and Del Toro, you don't know who is who. Who's the rich guy? Who's, who's the, rich? the guy getting? A, who's the convict? Either one. That that's what that's what's fascinating. And then you got ha. Pacino <laughs> running around out there. That, that, this is turning into a project I had never heard of until today again. And now I'm going, I want to hear more about it. Remember what Franco was able to do in Spring Break? Yes. To the, the role yeah. he, was, yeah. he was so able to step outside of himself. So will Pacino be able to do that? Will, will Franco do that again? Will either one of these guys? That's an exciting prospect. Look if at Franco my... is his character from Spring Breakers? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, what's next? A new trailer for the upcoming Entourage movie has hit the web following yesterday's reveal of a new official poster for the film. Entourage is set to hit AMC theaters on June 5th. Mark, buy or sell this new trailer for the Entourage movie. All right, look, yes, I'm, I'm going to buy this trailer, and I realized it yesterday. I said I liked the poster because it didn't rely on any other famous people being in it. <laughs> and this entire trailer is made of cameo appearances by famous people. My favorite one is the middle picture we have of Liam Neeson with his middle finger. I think that's hysterical. <laughs> but this is what I want to see in an Entourage movie because we did get a lot of celebrity cameos just in the trailer, but we also got to see what the story is going to be, and it's the perfect story for where these guys would be in their career. It is an actor who wants to be 
a director. It's a studio head saying, you're crazy. You have some other little storylines that are going to be subplots. It's going on with Turtle and Ronda Rousey and E having a baby, it looks like. So I think that that all those storylines are going to be ripe with comedy, but they're not going to overtake the movie and its fun, silly tone that it's going to have. So yes, I'm totally buying this trailer. Yeah, I love the trailer. I'm going to buy it too. And the reason I, I love the trailer is because I've talked a lot about how the appeal of Entourage was not its deep narrative, which is why when they got into the Vinny getting on cocaine stuff, the, the show kind of came off the rails yeah. for me. The show's about lifestyle porn. The show's about hanging out with these guys like as they you know travail Hollywood and do all this kind of stuff. And that's what the trailer gave us. It showed us them landing in private jets on big party boats with sexy girls in bikinis and making business, you know, hanging out with business calls. And it gives you a little bit of glimpse of the story. You're right. Yeah, the next movie I start when I want to direct, you know, all that kind of stuff. It look, this is not going to be a deep film. And the trailer was a proper representation of that. I think it feeds into what the appeal of the show was in the first place. And part of the appeal of the show was all these random celebrity mm -hmm. things. So it actually fit quite well for me. So for this movie, it was a great trailer. I buy it. Yeah, I buy it as well. And the other thing, the appeal for what this show was initially was this was right off the, the heels of Sex and the City. This was, this mm. was Sex and the City for dudes. Um, and the trailer showed that. It was everything that was fresh and fun about the original series. The series, as most series do, when you get five, six, seven seasons in, you lose some steam on it. And the, the, this show started to, and they ended it. And by the, the it was also because the characters had nowhere else to go. And in this trailer, you see the dynamic with Vinny and Ari now. They still have that friendly dynamic, but it's a different position now because Ari's not the agent anymore. Now he's right. a studio head. So now you're going to have to see. I've never seen Ari act as a studio head yet. I'm very interested to see how that happens. The dynamic is still there with the friends. The, the jokes are there. And you have to show the cameos. That was one of the biggest thing about Entourage was who's going to be in it. And they show people in the past. Like Liam Neeson, I don't think, has ever been on the show, but I want to see him on the show. Dice mm -hmm. had a really fun role on it when he was on in the last like season or two. Your boy Gary Buse. See. Gary, B uh, <laughs> I, I believe I'll be in it again. This time eating bagels backwards with Vinny Chase. Uh, <laughs> I am looking forward to this movie. Big buy on the trailer. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email it in to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see your question here on AMC Movie Talk. Maybe you'll see it on the weekend show on Saturdays and Sundays we got called AMC Mailbag. So for now, let's see what's in the mailbag. Sinead, what do we got? Jago Matt writes, love the show and watch every day. My question is, when studios film two movies back to back, why do they always seem to release them a year apart? Why not sooner? Thanks and keep up the good work. Um, well, there's, I think there's two dynamics at play here about why they go uh, that far apart. Remember, even though you shoot it back to back, which is, look, if you are a studio and you are committed to doing these two films no matter what, then it just makes sense to shoot them back to back. It reduces your production costs a lot. It makes a lot of the... Uh, 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 just the functionality of getting it done from start to finish logistically, it makes it a lot simpler and a lot easier. But don't forget that once they are done that big shoot, then they go into all the post-production and get really heavy on the first movie first. And then once that's done, they've got like another four or five months of work to do on that second movie to do all the things that needs to happen after the, the, the camera st stop rolling. But that's the first part. The second part is this, is you want that first film to marinate with the audience a little bit. You want that to build up word of mouth. You want it to get its home video release. You want more and more people to come to it. Because like if you released, say, you know, Sandbag Man Part 1 on, you know, on June 1st and then Sandbag Man Part 2 on July 1st, what happens is... Hey, guys, I'm back. <laughs> I got my sandbag. Hey, why are you sandbagging me? <laughs> it's better than teabag, man. Anyway, oh what could have happened is... What you, think, what you do then is you've guaranteed that only people who went to that first month theatrical release of Sandbag Man Part 1 will even be interested in seeing Sandbag Man Part 2. You give it a year, you hopefully can increase interest in the film. After the first run, you get more people to come to number two. So, and I think one year is a nice, you know, I don't like when they wait two or three, right. but I think one year is a really good thing. That way you also get to release it around the same time that the first one was released. So that's why I say, how do you guys see it? Well, How I cool is... Chris, Chris Pine is up for Sandbag Man. <laughs> Chris Pine. <laughs> I just want to see the teaser poster for Sandbag 3, which is where the teabagger is the villain, and all it is <laughs> is, is, is you just see like a little <laughs> string in a teabag like, like laying there like, oh my god, that's the guy. <laughs> We're making um, great movies. I, I agree. I agree with you. I think that it's it's also <laughs> being able to. And I also remember the season that they put it out too. Let's say 
they did this once six months with Matrix Two and Matrix Three. Remember when Matrix yes, Two? They, yeah. and, and I don't know if they. I don't think they did it with Harry Potter. Did they, maybe they did. I think that one Harry Potter was in like uh, the November season, and then one came out in in June. Um, I like the year. A lot of what you said because the, the setup, the marketing gives it gives the team to reset to be able to market their movie, like you said, the Blu-ray. But it's also season too. If you put something out in June or July, and then you get you get next summer also and you own the summer and summer movie season is where you if we're talking blockbusters here you know right. a lot of t- that's really the only ones that are shot back to back anyway but uh yeah so it, it makes sense i'd rather have a year than a year and a half but you're gonna get um well i mean I guess it depends with star wars you'll get this the episode eight i guess six months after uh the spin-off but it's not really back to back movie shot so yeah, yeah but yeah. not everything star wars too when you're talking about a franchise right, because yeah, people yeah. need time to digest stuff they need time to see something and then just okay they'll we'll take stock of it they need time to debate it online they need time to get ready to get revved up they want to see a teaser trailer you know they want to get excited about the next film so with star wars that's actually my only concern as a huge star wars fan is are we going to be oversaturated even with something as cool as star wars if you have all these movies and all these tv shows and all these books coming at us is are we going to get star wars fatigue i think that no. when it comes out no, I, don't think so. I don't think so either but i think that with something like you know uh, back to the future the matrix or even um y- you know pirates of the caribbean something like that where they they need to space it out a little bit so the audience just gets time to catch their breath all right but by the way speaking of sandbag man it was chris pratt by the way that was our uh, production I, I, you know i wish i should have had the picture here and ready to go but i don't but yesterday camera i think it was on heroes we started talking about the disney films uh, on planes it mm-hmm. was either i can't remember it was movie talk or heroes we started talking about that and it was like there's planes this and now planes that and planes everything and then schnepp said like planes home invasion planes and, home invasion and yeah. then i was like hey somebody sent me a picture and somebody sent me this picture mm-hmm. That looks so perfect. You see a couple of planes in the background, but then one of the planes close up, but with a black mask over its face <laughs> with a home late at night. It's like absolutely. I don't know why I'm bringing that up. It's totally irrelevant to the show. Okay, folks. Now, listen, before we get to our Twitter questions, and, and, and by the way, folks, we also like to take your questions via Twitter. So if you'd like to see your Twitter, your tweet on our show, just tweet a question with the hashtag AMC Movie Talk. So just tweet a question with the hashtag AMC Movie Talk. But before we get to that, I think I'm going to get really, I think I'm going to run out of town if I don't bring this up. A picture got released today of, uh, I was going to say Michael Eisner. It is not Michael Eisner. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Eisenberg. Jesse Eisenberg. <laughs> Why was I going to say Michael Eisner? <laughs> Michael would Eisner would be a great Lex Luthor. Some would call him Lex Luthor, depending on who you talk <laughs> to. Right, yeah. Um, uh, came out from, I believe it was from Entertainment Weekly, with a picture of uh, Eisenberg with his shaved head, and there it is. Um, it, with him, I guess, in the character of Lex Luthor. And I wasn't even going to make this a part of the show because it's just a picture of the dude with a shaved head. It's not even from the movie. But but uh, a couple people, especially Dennis, said, John, people are going to want you guys to talk about this. So <laughs> here we are. We're putting it in. So my commentary on this, it's it's the dude with a shaved head looking at the camera. I, I, I mean, everybody knows how stoked and excited I am for Batman v Superman. I cannot wait for that movie. And I actually even really like him at cast as Lex Luthor. I know a lot of people didn't. But I, I'm, I'm not going to get excited nor nor lose interest because, yeah, it's it's him, who I knew as Lex Luthor, looking at a camera with his head shaved. I, I, I can't get excited about this one or the other. Mark? The best supporting actor category for 2016 <laughs> has been closed. It goes to that man. But look, I, when, when he was cast as Lex Luthor, I loved the decision because I was imagining him with a bald head. I had never seen him with a bald head. Now he shaves. That's how he looks anyway. I think that, it, I mean, he looks, he looks upset. He, he looks upset. He, <laughs> he looks like a tortured evil genius who's like, who in the hell? Wait, there's an alien and there's this rich billionaire that are meddling with my plans? He looks like a supervillain. Yes, this is cool. I'm excited. <laughs> Christian? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that it's actually pretty relevant to put this picture out, even though it's not necessarily from the movie, uh, because you guys both said uh, like you you like you did you like the casting of it you like the casting of it you were excited about it you didn't care because you were ready you just want to see the movie and you were yeah. I didn't like the casting for this when I when this came and out this picture changes your mind uh, it, it, my my mind has been changed over the last couple of, okay. of months but this makes me feel better for changing my mind 
when I see that picture and I, I feel like an idiot for questioning it in the first place because good oh, good good thank you <laughs> uh, you are not going to be in sad bag man good <laughs> um, but he, you see him and you look okay that's why they cast him because they knew that they, he looks like Lex Luthor that's the first like legit Lex Luthor we've seen in a long time no offense to Kevin Spacey but that's Lex Luthor man I mean and we don't know the relevance of what that was granted it was promotional shot but was it a you know what was he filming something that day when they when they shot him you know when, when was he able was he acting in a scene right afterwards so that's cool to me I really I'm excited they put it out I remember one of the things I, I used to get frustrated as time was going on in the cast just before they announced him as Lex Luthor you had a lot of people for a long time saying Brian Cranston needs to be Lex Luthor and and I liked the idea I did mm -hmm. but you know at the time we were also always would say well let's find out what this Lex Luthor is before we start saying who should play him, right? But, but everyone said, no, no, look at, and they'd send me pictures of Brian Cranston because he had a shaved head. Look, he's definitely Lex Luthor. And do you remember this one? I'm sure you guys see this one too. Billy Zane. Remember? Yeah. The, the yeah. people start, oh no, Billy Zane needs right. to be Lex Luthor. And I would say, why? Look at this picture. And it was <laughs> Billy Zane with a shaved head. <laughs> and it's like everybody started losing their mind because somebody's got a picture of them with a shaved head. Therefore, that means he's Lex Luthor. And, and that's kind of the feeling I get. Look, like I said, I actually really like the casting. I, I like, I was okay with it at first. It's really grown on me, especially once we found out who this Lex Luthor is. I'm excited about him playing Lex Luthor now. I think he's the right guy to do it for now until we see the movie. But. I, Oh, look, his head's shaved. It, now let's get excited. It is just a picture of the guy with a shaved head. You're right. But the difference is that guy has been cast as mm -hmm. Lex mm -hmm. Luthor. So, Good but, point. so if, if I would have seen that picture, though, if that picture was floating around before he was cast, then I'm like, look at Jesse Eisenberg. He should be cast. <laughs> should be but but the Luther. difference is, though, he has been cast. Yeah. That's what he looks like. That is Lex Luthor. Like, there's not a, like, maybe what if thing. That's him. So I'm like, so that's why the picture gets me excited more because that is officially who you are going to see. How many balding actors were upset when they heard <laughs> their agents were like, I know you're going bald, but I got a role for you. Right. Then Jesse, he's like, he has hair. Why'd they cast him? Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I think that's a really good point. What I'm really curious about is I want to know from you guys if, first of all, let me know right off the bat, jump in the comments section and let us know have you been for or against this Jesse Eisenberg casting as Lex Luthor? And has this picture done anything to either make you more excited or less excited for the role? I'd love to hear what you guys say about that. So jump on down in the comment section and let us know. With that all being said, let's get to your Twitter questions. So Sinead, what's in the Twitter sphere? All right, Crazy Steve tweets, Inception or Interstellar? Which one did you think was the best? Nice question. I think you're going to hear a lot of people go two different ways in this. For me, it's Inception. While Interstellar, I think, had the best single character... Uh, Matthew McConaughey's character, I think, was really well fleshed out. You got emotionally attached to him. Great visuals as well. I think it takes it there. But I think everything else, from the com the beautiful complexity to the narrative line and everything in Inception, I think Inception was the better film. That's just me. Christian, what about you? Well, it's funny, too, because I know that in my review of Interstellar, I was kind of like, I was a little disappointed in it. I watched it again recently, and I loved it the second time. Um, but I still like Inception more. Inception, to me, is one of my favorite movies. Um, of, of It would be in my top 20. I, I love. Oh, nice! I love that movie, and I love the the score by Hans Zimmer. Like "Time" by Hans Zimmer is a movie, a song I just hear because, it, and not only do I love that song, it fit that scene at the very end so well. It, Nolan just did everything so well in that film, and I like that kind of dream world and the surrealism of it. But Interstellar is a great film. If you watch it again, I'd say people who didn't like it the first time to go back and revisit that film because you pick up a lot more, and it really is a beautiful visual, um, cerebral film. As soon as I can borrow your Blu-ray player, I will do yeah, just yeah. that. I think that I, I think they're both amazing achievements. I love the the effort. I love the the what they were reaching for with both of these films. I think Inception pulled it off a little bit better because when I saw Interstellar, there were a couple moments where I'm like, eh, there's a, there's a line that Anne Hathaway has in there. There's the decision that her character makes, and I'm like, oh, that's going to take me out of the movie for a second. <laughs> Plus, I had seen something like that, and it's no it's no fault of Interstellar, but I saw Gravity the year before. It just happened to beat it to the punch with a lot of those visuals. So I wasn't as blown away seeing Interstellar for the first time because I had a frame of reference for it. Mm. I never heard of anything like Inception. I never even thought, I never dreamt of the concept of breaking into somebody's dream. And then once you're in that dream, breaking into another dream. It's just the coolest thing in the world to me. When I go to sleep now, I hope I have a dream that I can break into. Like it's that, it's that level of awesome that that movie stayed with me since it came out to this day. And I don't think Interstellar is going to quite reach that level for this guy. Well, clearly someone's never seen the movie Dreamscape with Dennis Quaid. 
<laughs> I need to borrow your Blu-ray player. <laughs> All right, what's next? At JT underscore Shadow 35 tweets, Hey, everyone, who did a better job taking over a franchise? David Yates with Potter or Justin Lin with the Fast and Furious films? Mm, uh, Freddy Krueger. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, what, look, what, what Yates did with Harry Potter is he took a, a property that was already very popular with a lot of people and already had a pretty decent track record of success and was doing well. And I feel, I believe he elevated it. Um, and so he did great. However, I thought the Fast and Furious franchise was a joke up until number three, uh, right up to number three. I thought, and three was the worst of the bunch. Uh, I, I just hated this series. I didn't think it, I thought nothing redeemable about that series whatsoever. Then all of a sudden, four comes along. And I'm like that wasn't so bad. Five, that was great, and six was holy crap. And I, I have not yet seen seven, although a lot of us on AMC Movie News have seen it. So I, I'm going to have to give it to Lynn for, because of how much of a shift he made in the in the general audience's perception of their franchise. I, I have to give it to Lynn a little bit. Christian, what about you? Lynn's team was losing badly and he grabbed the ball and ran and no one could catch him yeah. and but he handed the ball off again and now we don't know where that where, where that franchise is going james Wan is pretty capable hands but david yates took it all the way home scored <laughs> walked off into the sunset he took the harry potter franchise which was already going in a direction that everyone loved the books were beloved and he he carried on elevated each movie. And when you have this continuous series, I think Harry Harry Potter is one of the best complete franchises that we've ever had. Like, how many franchises can you say? Like, almost every movie was just a solid, well put together film that carried and was true to the mythology. And I think David Yates, even though I I agree with you that it's it's presented material, but he elevated that material. So oh, Yates. which Yates? Yates. Sorry. Yates. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Yates. We were looking for one word. Yes, for Yates. <laughs> um, I I would have to give it to Yates too, simply because as much as I love the Fast and Furious movies for what they are, I never needed them again, and I still don't. Like I, I'm not I'm not jonesing for another Fast and Furious. I think they're fun movies. I love shoving popcorn in my face and watching all this stuff go on on screen. But my life would still be complete. There's a lot of people. That, that, that grew up reading Harry Potter. There's a lot of people that, that desperately cared. That's their Star Wars. That's their Lord of the Rings for a for an entire generation of fans. So for Yates to be able to, like what Christian said, take the ball and continue to elevate it, not just make it kid-friendly films, which would have been fine. It would have been cool if it was just all oh, this nice family entertainment. He made those appealing for adults. The first Harry Potter movie comes out, and that's for that's for uh, you know parents to take their kids and little kids. By the time the last Harry Potter film came out, everybody wanted to go see that, including single dudes in their 30s. <laughs> Good point. Thank Good you. Good point. Yeah. All right, what's next? <laughs> all right, a our third tweets. Ian McKellen remembered more as Magneto or Gandalf. That's, that's a great question, because somebody actually asked us on the show the other day, will... Uh, Patrick Stewart be more remembered for Picard or for Charles Xavier. So I think this is a fair question too. Um, I don't think it's as close though as the Patrick Stewart one. I think it's Gandalf because Gandalf is a character. Well, well, you know, Patrick Stewart or Ian McKellen kind of gave us our first real look at uh, Magneto. Gandalf was a guy that has been beloved and loved before we ever had any visualizations of him or any kind of a live action incarnation of the character. And he came along and he gave it to us in a way that everybody loved. And because of that, while everybody will remember him very fondly for what he did as Magneto, and you know, as good as Michael Fassbender is, when I think Magneto, I still think Ian McKellen. But when I think Ian McKellen, my first thought goes to Gandalf. So that's just me personally. What about you? Uh, the X Men are losing another one. You know, I, <laughs> I, the, the Professor X and Magneto are two iconic, uh, iconic characters. The actors playing them are terrific. But Gandalf is just he's he's just that guy that you the for for whatever reason he's a he's a wizard that smokes some very mysterious stuff and he goes and he recruits <laughs> hobbits for crazy missions but you feel like you can relate to that dude for whatever reason and magneto always i just felt that was that's a supervillain that's what a supervillain is that's what he does he moves metal that's neat it's scary he poses a threat to our team i think that gandalf got to another level that you can't describe but like the wizard character there is just some sort of magic in that role that i don't know that you can quantify so i definitely go gandalf Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> he's played he's played Gandalf in six movies. Yeah. Um now he's played Magneto in quite a few as well, but he's the only one that's played Gandalf in six movies. Yeah. Now, you, now you mentioned Fastbender and out of the two of them you do remember him first as Magneto, but Fastbender is also Magneto. So and Fastbender will continue to play Magneto in a couple other movies and he's been a great Magneto. 
you it's just there's a difference to one solid character that he's played throughout it. You just you remember him right away because Gandalf, like you said, is such an iconic character before the movies. Like, and he, that's even who Obi Wan was based off of was Gandalf. Yeah, and Ian, Ian uh, Kellen really he he made you believe that uh, Gandalf was alive. He did the same with Magneto, but it's Gandalf. Okay, who wins in a fight, real quick? Gandalf. Gandalf. Okay. I would find <laughs> a way. <laughs> I, Magneto can manipulate metal. He can suck that ring. It's, I don't know. Well, I mean, the other, thing, I mean, the other thing to keep in, too, if you want to get really sorry, I mean, Magneto, technically, he could rip the planet in half and just kill everybody. Right. There. Just you go right. right to the magnetic core of the Earth and go... And no, there's a lot apart. of forests. See, Brett Ratner? See? Forest. <laughs> don't put him in a forest. No metal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of AMC Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us today. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, make sure you look in the description of this video for our podcast feed. And listen, don't forget, we got our Animation Movie Madness tournament going on. Round one is now done. The voting is complete. We will announce the winners from round one and the round two matchups on Friday, so keep your eyes open for that. I want to thank, first of all, the guy sitting at the table with me, sitting to my left, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? Uh, at 5150 Ellis on Twitter and on Instagram. This Saturday night, I'll be at the World Famous Comedy Store in Los Angeles on Sunset. Of course, sitting to my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? You shall not pass. Sorry, sorry, I can't get out of my head. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Christian Harloff. And make sure to start sending those tweets in. Hashtag AMC Jedi Council. Get the questions in tomorrow, next episode. And of course, our lovely host today, Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. And you guys can follow me on Facebook or on Twitter. Just follow me at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until next time. Bye-bye.